on this edition of MSNBC Reports. Something drove me to do this. Normal people just don't do this. For more than 30 years, he lived among us. Father, scout leader, serial killer. I am PGK. I'm the guy they're after. Now, exclusive jailhouse recordings obtained by NBC News reveal the twisted mind and motives of the notorious killer Dennis Rader, the man called BTK. That's been a big thing with me. It's having bound and tied. His own chilling words reveal the monster inside the man, still craving attention. I really feel pretty good. I feel like I'm kind of like a star right now. No remorse, little emotion. He just talks like he's coming home from a day at the office. Tears, only for himself. Can you go out, uh, out fresh air, walk you all up, hug your wife? A minute by minute, year-by-year year account of Raider's crimes and the shattered families left behind. A beautiful, loving, kind, gentle person being murdered and dumped out in the ditch like a bag of dirty laundry. Sentenced to life. Nancy and all of his victims will be waiting with God and watching him as he burns in hell. You'll hear new details about the capture of the killer who eluded police for three decades. What nailed him was his hubris. He went too far. Edie Magnus with exclusive tapes that take us inside the mind of BTK. He's just evil, evil personified. And now, with confessions of BTK, here is Stone Phillips. Good evening. What was so remarkable about the capture of the serial killer called BTK was that the man himself seemed so unremarkable. When police announced this father of two, Dennis Rader, was the killer who had preyed on parents, children, women, the mystery only deepened. Who is he? What drove him? Tonight, videotapes of a conversation with a killer broadcast for the first time might provide some insight. This jailhouse interview, disturbing as it is, might also offer insight to the families of BTK's victims who have struggled for decades with the painful question, why? Here's Edie Magnus. Joseph Otero, a champion boxer and Air Force veteran, killed at 38. His wife, Julie, proud mother of their five children, was 34. Their daughter, Josephine, was just 11 years old and son Joseph Jr. was nine. Kathy Bright, pretty and popular, whose life ended when she was 21. Shirley Vianne, 24 and the mother of three, sang in her church choir. Nancy Fox worked two jobs to try to get ahead. She was 25. Maureen Hedge, mother of four, was 53. Vicki Weggerly cared for children in her home, including her own two. She was 28. Dolores Davis, a grandmother and secretary, retired at age 62, just months before she was murdered. Ten innocent people murdered to satisfy the twisted needs of one selfish man. A man who for more than 30 years frustrated police, taunted the media, and terrorized the citizens of Wichita, Kansas. BTK seemed uncatchable. Everyone wondered who he was, where he was, when a most unlikely man who'd lived among them all along, Dennis Rader, was arrested. I am BGK. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm the guy they're after, 100%. On this program, you'll see new information that offers insight into the deviant mind of Dennis Rader. If I had never gone into sexual fantasies, really off the deep end, I never became what I was. He is just the most unique, unprecedented combination of perversion packaged to look like a human being that I've ever seen. You'll hear his excuses on why he says he had to kill. Uh, they, fantasies are what got me in trouble. I just went from one fantasy to bigger and bigger and bigger, and pretty soon I was involved in murder, and then that fueled the next one, and it just went on and on. There is one Dennis Rader, and that's a murderer, that's a coward. All told in an appallingly matter-of-fact manner. And put a garment over his neck and pulled up on it. That's when I guess Factor X, whatever, the monster took over totally then. There's no monster in him. He is the monster himself. Tonight, an exclusive jailhouse interview with the man who named himself BTK for his propensity to bind, torture, and kill his victims. We'll examine Dennis Rader's three decades-long reign of terror, 
and the exhaustive police investigation that finally caught him. We'll also get an inside look at a man with two lives, a husband, a father, a Cub Scout leader, and church president living unassumingly in his community, but also a man who secretly hunted down and killed 10 innocent people and then bragged about it in his insatiable thirst for attention. This interview, obtained by NBC News after it was completed, was conducted by a Harvard-trained forensic psychologist, Robert Mendoza, who performs more than 100 evaluations for criminal and civil cases each year. He was hired by the defense team to assess Raider's sanity. Go farther, why don't you just shut it down? I say, I can't, I can't. This specific conversation took place just a couple of hours after Raider had pleaded guilty to 10 counts of murder in June and put on what many people thought was a chilling performance in court. As you listen to what he says from behind bars to see what light it may shed, keep in mind Raider knew he was being taped and knew that it might be seen on national television. If you're looking for remorse from the BTK killer, you won't find it here. I was just a little embarrassed in front of the world. But uh, not totally. And, uh, you know, I, it didn't bother me too bad. Uh, you know, I, had, I could relax a little bit. I had water to drink. Yeah. So I, I didn't really feel too bad about it. Dennis Rader was a hometown boy, one of four sons raised in the Wichita area by church-going Lutheran parents. But while Rader appeared a clean-cut high school senior in this 1963 yearbook, his writings speak of his already having bizarre sexual fantasies. He kept them hidden as he served his country in the Air Force, then married a girl from home in 1971. But a couple of years later, Raider could no longer keep those fantasies locked only in his mind. His obsession with sex and bondage evolved into deviant, violent acts carried out on real people and ultimately led to murder. I got this fantasy. I started working out this fantasy in my mind. And once that potential, that person become a fantasy, I could just loop, loop it over. I could lay in bed at night thinking about this person, uh, the events and how it's going to happen. And it became a real, almost like a picture show. You know, I wanted to go ahead and produce it and direct it and go through with it, no matter what the costs were and the, you know, the consequences. Uh, this, it was going to happen one way or another. Maybe not that day, but it was going to happen. No one knows for sure why Raider had to kill to fulfill those fantasies. But in this interview with the psychologist, Raider says that he picked his first victims, members of the Otero family, utterly at random in late 1973. He recently had been laid off from a job and says he was feeling down and out at the time and had begun trolling, as he put it, in certain neighborhoods, including along Edgemore Drive, where the Oteros lived. Well, that neighborhood... I guess became a, uh, what I call a haunt, uh, as I call it. Uh, I had a special appeal to it. I'd been there, I started knowing the roads, I knew the people. You know, I drive by, watch cars, people pull out of their homes, and people go, wrote telephone numbers down, wrote addresses down. This is how it really started, right here, is by haunts. The, that area, the Edgemore area, was my first big haunt. Julie Otero, her husband, and their five children lived on Edgemore then. And it was just Mrs. Otero's terrible misfortune that she happened to catch Dennis Rader's eye while he was driving down her street. She came out of the house and took the kids to school, so I followed them to school. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's a corner house. That's a possibility. And I was in between work. Idle hands, what is it? Idle hands, what is it? Was devil's it? workshop? Yes. Mm -hmm. And all these things seemed to happen most of the time when I had idle hands. Mm -hmm. uh, I had just lost a job mm -hmm. in Cessna. Uh, that was demoralizing to me. So anyway, they became a potential target. Uh, so they were convenient. Convenient. Uh, uh, how did they fuel the sexual fantasy then? Was well, there Mrs. Specific about uh, Mrs. Otero was attractive, and then I saw Josephine too. Josephine was the Otero's 11-year-old daughter. How so I must have had that somewhere in my mind, a younger person that must have locked in on me. It would be nearly two months before Raider acted on the sexual fantasy involving Mrs. Otero and her daughter, which he says began brewing in his brain. And when he finally did, it would establish his pattern of brutality and deception toward all of his victims. Raider broke into the home of the objects of his obsession in January 1974. He says he entered the home that day a very anxious man, though he recounts the story with a strange lack of emotion. 
we were all extremely nervous, you know. And uh, and all of a sudden, and I already cut the phone line. I already cut the phone line. And uh, and it's funny because I left my knife. I left the cutters there. <laughs> and I can't had to come back and get those later. But uh, and the door opened. So here I am, you know. So do I just walk out the back door? They call the police, or I go for it. And I went for it. Chilling details of his first killings and of his victim's final words. Mrs. Lotero had woke up, and uh, and she actually said, uh, "Have God, God have mercy on your soul." When confessions of BTK continues. When Dennis Rader broke into the Otero's home, even though he was brandishing a gun, he says the family didn't take him too seriously at first. What happened once? They saw you. Okay, well, they thought it was a joke. Uh, I went in, I think it was a younger Otero. They were all in the kitchen, they were making sandwiches. The younger, male or female? No, it was the younger, the, boy, the junior, mm -hmm. uh, Joseph. Mm -hmm. Raider says to keep the family calm, he made up a story about why he was there. Well, Mr. Otero actually stepped up and told him that I was to come in for some uh, food. If I was wanted in California or wanted, I needed some food and water and some money and transportation. That was my ruse to uh, kind of calm him down. He kind of laughed a little bit. He said, well, this is a joke. You know, who said you were my brother-in-law? Raider says the family bought his lie about being on the run from the law and not wanting to hurt them. And so, at gunpoint, they acquiesced to his tying up all four of them, mother and father and younger son and daughter, without a struggle. So they were cooperating with him 100%, and that's probably... It was their demise. If they probably struggled and fought with me, that would have been a different story. But they felt fairly comfortable. So that's what I was going to do. As Raider tells this story, like he does so often, he paints his own conduct in the best possible light. So he says he took pains to make his victims feel even more comfortable by actually loosening some of the binds around their hands and feet. I'm trying to comfort them as much as I could. To get him quieter because he actually was worried about it. Both. Okay. Well, I, I'll yell, oh, I'm a bad guy. I, I care for people, you know, have concerns for people. So, and I hadn't really crossed that path yet where I was going to kill the people yet, so I was still in concern mode. What you're seeing here is a very early form of a future serial killer who's still trying to decide what it is he's going to get out of these crimes. We asked James Allen Fox, one of the nation's leading criminologists and a professor at Northeastern University, to give his analysis of this interview. He has studied serial killers for 25 years and has written numerous books. His most recent one on serial killers includes BTK. He wants to fulfill his fantasy, but it's not necessary for them to feel excessive suffering. At this stage, he hadn't yet made a decision to kill. I have all control completely. Uh, and then, I, and then I went in the other room and I thought, do I, do I just leave or what? Uh, they already know me, my, my face, so I went back and put a plastic bag over Mr. Otero's head and, uh, and put a garment over his neck and pulled up on it. And that's when it really hit the fan then, because they all could see what I was doing. Raider describes first strangling the mother and father while their 9-year-old son and 11-year-old daughter watched. Although he is describing acts of unspeakable cruelty, his voice is utterly devoid of emotion, which makes listening to it that much harder. The kids were watching us? Yes, they were watching it. They were screaming and hollering. Uh, Did you want to move them from the scene at all? No, no. Uh, it, I, I had to get in control. It, it was really noisy. They were, you know, they were screaming. and The noise was bothering Yeah, the noise was bothering me. And I knew the mailman would be out there or somebody would be walking by. So I had to control it very quickly. He says he found the noise annoying. Because he only looks at these events from his own perspective. This is all a script designed to please him. Because remember, it was almost like these people weren't real. They were just actors and they didn't matter. What mattered was his enjoyment and the kid screaming was just taken away from his enjoying all of this stuff. How can he, how can he get aroused with all these kids screaming? He completely dehumanizes. Yes. The well, kids. <laughs> serial killers are very good at that. That makes it possible for them to kill. It was just something that I had to do. Uh, once I started with Mr. Otero, I knew I had to do all, I had to do all four of them. Uh, it's like an execution. Once you started, if there was witnesses, you had to do it all the way around. 
For someone who seems so callous, you might assume Raider was always a coolly efficient killer. But the way he tells it, Raider didn't have a clue how much force it took to end a life, and so tried several times to strangle Mrs. Otero, only to have her wake up again. During the woman's last desperate struggle for consciousness, Raider says she was fully aware he was snuffing out the lives of her husband and two children. In what he says were her last words to him, Mrs. Otero's humanity shines against the killer's inhumanity. Mrs. Otero had woke up and, uh, and she actually said, uh, have God, God have mercy on your soul, that's what she said. And, uh, put her down, permanently. <clears throat> this woman who probably knows now that she might be going to die, she is generous with you, asking God to have mercy on your soul. Mm -hmm. Pretty generous thing to tell somebody's going to kill you. That's killed and tortured her family and is about to do the same to her. Yeah. Raider eventually took young Josephine Otero down to the basement of her home and hanged her from a pipe. The police found semen near Josephine's body. And going forward, recollections of what he had done with these victims, fueled his desire to do it again. Raider says now the whole experience left him quaking. Well, I was really on a, not a uh, sexual high, I was just scared high. I was really nervous, sweating, I had sweat running off me all over the place. And I just, you know, I had gloves on, I had rubber gloves, and they were just full of water, sweat. Uh, I was really, my clothes were just soaked with sweat. Very nervous, not like a master criminal at all. This was my first, my first time that I'd ever crossed that barrier. Several hours later, this Charlie Otero, then 15, um, and his sister Carmen, then 13, came home from school. As I walked through the back door, I noticed the kitchen was in disarray. Um, things were on the floor, it didn't look right, and I yelled out, is anybody home? That's when I heard my sister cry out, Charlie, come quick. I ran through the hallway down to the bedroom and I found Carmen with my parents. Uh, my father was tied up. His eyes were bulging. His tongue was about bit off. My mother was on the bed. She didn't even look like my mother. And uh, I looked at my dad, and I could, I could smell the, the death and the, the fear in the room. And Charlie and Carmen had not seen what had happened to their younger brother and sister when they were taken to the police station. They say they told police to make sure Joseph Jr. and Josephine did not enter the home. So I was telling the police the whole time, go to Josie and Joey's school and keep them from coming home. I do not want them to come home and find the house the way it is, with police everywhere. We were afraid of, of what they would see. Um, we were at the police department for quite a while, and we kept asking them, you know, did you get a hold of the little ones? And finally, they, they finally told us, you don't have to worry about that. Um, um, they were killed also. When they told me about Josie and Joey, I just died inside. After that day, I lost my religion instantly. The minute I saw my mother, I said, there cannot be a God. Not only can there not be a God, but I hate him if he is a God, if there is one. A despair not difficult to understand from a man whose mother, father, sister, and brother were slaughtered in their own home, horribly and inexplicably. While the Oteros were the first, they would not be the last people to fall victim to Dennis Rader's hellish world. More bodies, more suffering loved ones, more questions about who he was and why he was doing this. Probing deeper into a dark mind. I don't think it was actually the person that I was after. I think it was the dream. They're just an object. That's all it worked. A cat and mouse game with the police begins when Confessions of BTK continues. When Wichita police learned that two children and their parents had been murdered, they of course looked at the likeliest suspects, people who knew the family. Police, however, were about to learn that they were dealing with a serial killer, a man who three decades later would offer details about his crimes and his callousness in tapes never broadcast before. Again, Edie Magnus. 
murdering four members of the Otero family, Dennis Rader spent the next several years killing again and again and again. His next three victims were all young women. In this interview with the psychologist, Rader dismisses each victim as a project. He says he'd begin by stalking. The stalking stage is when you start learning more about your victims, potential victims. I uh, went to the library, I looked up their names, their address, cross-reference, and called them a couple of times, drove by there whenever I could. And each time he struck, Rader said he was armed with what he calls his hit kit. Did it contain what? Uh, plastic bags, rope, tape, uh, knife, gun. All those wouldn't be in the kit, they'd be where I could have them in the house and gather them up. Tools that would come to define the work of BTK. The victims were often discovered bound with tape or rope tied in unusual knots. She had to have the control, which is the bonding. That's been a big thing with me. And, uh, my sexual fantasy is if I'm, if I'm going to kill a victim or do something a victim is have them bound and tied. Um, now, somewhere along the line, in my dreams, I had what they call torture chambers, and, and, and to relieve your sexual fantasies, you have to go to the, the kill. Three months after the Otero murders, in April of 1974, Raider's next victim was Kathy Bright, a 21-year-old college student. Once again, he'd selected her randomly while driving down her street, as he told the court in June. And I saw her go in the house with somebody else, and I thought that's a possibility. Raider's plan was to lie in wait and overtake Kathy when she came home. But the plan went awry when she unexpectedly showed up with her brother Kevin. Raider said in court he was able to get brother and sister tied up, but the knots that bound Kevin were not holding. Were you armed with a handgun at that time also? Yes, I had a handgun. What happened when you I came actually back? had two handguns. Uh, well, I started strangling. The, either the uh, Barrett broke or he broke his bonds and he jumped up real quick like. I pulled my gun and quickly shot him. I hit him in the head. He fell over. Uh, I could see the blood. And Raider said he thought Kevin was dead and turned to strangle Kathy when he heard Kevin move. The two men struggled again and Raider shot him for a second time in the head. He then continued trying to strangle Kathy but was unsuccessful and so stabbed her multiple times in the chest. Meanwhile, much to Raider's surprise, Kevin had somehow managed to escape, though his head wounds from the gunshots left him unable to clearly describe the killer to police. I thought the police were coming at that time. I heard the door open, I thought, no, that's it. And I stepped out there, and he, I could see him running down the street, so I quickly cleaned up everything that I could and left. Six months later, in October 1974, Raider announced himself to authorities in the first of many letters he sent to newspapers and other media outlets, communiques that would come to include poems and puzzles. It began a campaign that would reveal his other motive to kill, publicity, a twisted desire for celebrity, a sick obsession that Raider, like some other serial killers, had to be known and feared to get credit for all his handiwork. It was Raider who came up with BTK as a name for himself. I just put in one of the first letters. I was really surprised I put it out that first. I think it was just buying, torture, kill. Now I have a label on me. It was like the, like the Green River Killer and Son of Sam and uh, a whole slew of others, the, the uh, Boston Strangler. The police now knew the murders of the Otero family and Kathy Bright were linked, that they had a serial killer in their midst. For tactical reasons, though, it would be several years before they disclosed that information to the public. Still, they wanted to communicate with the mysterious strangler. Police quietly placed a classified ad in the big hometown daily, BTK, help is available. There was no response, and Raider did not kill again for three years. You know, it wasn't something I just could do all the time, so whenever it was convenient, mm -hmm. it would have been easier probably if you were like a spy or something where you could go sit there and watch, but I didn't have that. I had to work under a camouflage. Then in March 1977, Raider struck again. His victim, Shirley Vianne, 24 years old. He said in court he'd watched her young son walk into the house and spontaneously chose that family to victimize. I kind of forced myself in. I just walked in, just opened the door, walked in, and then pulled his pistol. Shirley Vianne was home with her three small children, 
whom Raider corralled into a bathroom. Uh, the kids were really banging on the door, hollering, screaming. It's horrifying to remember that Raider himself was a young father at this time. His own son was not yet two. But with the sounds of the Vian children in the background, he said he simply worked as fast as he could. Comforted her a little bit, and then I went ahead and tied her up, and then uh, put a bag, a bag over her head and strangled her. In another admission that reveals Raider's depravity, he told the psychologist the thrill had little to do with the kill, or for that matter, with the victim herself. And I don't think it was actually the person that I was after. I think it was the dream. Uh, I know that's not really nice to say about a person, but they were basically an object. They were just an object. It's not like we're, I had more satisfaction building up to it and afterwards than I did the actual killing of the person. Many serial killers objectify their victim. They dehumanize them. They're tools, they're instruments for their own pleasures. How does someone who is a married young father mm -hmm. objectify people and kill them? The process is called compartmentalization. Many people are able to divide the world into those they care about and love, truly, and everyone else who's expendable. He says that he had more satisfaction anticipating his kills and in the aftermath of killing than he did mm -hmm. in the actual killing. That's his fantasy. The planning process, the stalking, the hunting is very enjoyable to him. And the aftermath, once he's killed, to see that he, to see what he's done. That's fulfilling too. That's when he would literally climax. The sexual fantasies, the obsession with bondage. Raider claims it's been swirling in his head since he was a child. He remembers being aroused as a young child when his mother would spank him. Raider has written in letters, which no one's sure are true, that he secretly perused S&M magazines as a boy, stole panties, peeped in windows. He writes of hanging a cat and then a dog. How does sexual fantasy and even an obsession with bondage lead to murder. It doesn't necessarily. What makes serial killers different than other people who might fantasize about power, dominance, control, is that they do not have a legitimate way to satisfy their need for power. So they take, they take and grab that power in the most violent way. At the end of 1977, in December, Dennis Rader killed his seventh victim, Nancy Fox. Uh, broke in and waited for her to come home in the kitchen. This time, Raider's plans went smoothly as the single working girl who was just 25 came home alone. Uh, I confronted her, uh, told her there I was a, uh, I had a problem, sexual problem, that I would have to tie her up and have sex with her. Raider said he handcuffed and tied Nancy Fox, strangled her with a belt, left his telltale semen by the body, and got out without a hitch. Then he called the police. Raider actually had the audacity to phone 911 and alert authorities to his own crime. You will find a homicide at 43 South Pershing. Nancy Fox. I'm sorry, sir, I can't understand you. What is the address? Okay, 843 South Pershing. That's correct. In the jailhouse interview, Raider said in hindsight, he thinks that call was dumb. That was kind of a that was kind of an impulse and really a really stupid thing to do because uh, I left my voice pattern and my voice on there. And still, Raider was not done communicating. The following month, he sent a poem written with a child's printing set on an index card to the Wichita Eagle newspaper. The poem, patterned after a nursery rhyme, referred to Shirley Vianne's murder. Several days later, he sent another letter, the most disturbing one yet, the one that finally put the killer on the news and put the community in a tailspin. What kind of leads do you have? We have absolutely nothing that will point us to any one particular individual. A killer, now in the spotlight he craves. He absolutely terrorized the community. Everyone was a suspect. The fear was palpable. When Confessions of BTK continues, I sat in my office and read his account of what he had done. And I wasn't ready for that. It was February 1978, and then TV News Director Ron Lowen was reading with disgust and revulsion a letter that had arrived in his newsroom at Cake TV. There was no doubt in my mind that it was from BTK. In a two-page single-space letter, Raider, using the name BTK, 
again announced himself as a serial killer and then went even further in his bid for publicity, comparing himself to Son of Sam in New York, Jack the Ripper in London, and the Hillside Strangler in Los Angeles, claiming they were all driven to kill by what he called Factor X. It seems senseless, but we cannot help it, he wrote. There is no help, no cure except death or being caught and put away. He was making it clear that uh, he wanted to be uh, elevated to the Serial Killer Hall of Fame. This is the league that he said he should be in. He listed 15 to 17 additional serial killers, uh, infamous serial killers. Through the ages? Through the ages. BTK is a student, was the first thing that flashed through my mind, of serial murders. Along with a lurid description of the Otero killings, Lowen says the killer was literally begging for ink. A little paragraph in the newspaper would have been enough. How many people do I have to kill until I get the recognition I deserve? I've always thought that, uh, you know, he had the, uh, the misfortune, given his aspirations, to live in a small media market. You know, he never got the attention because he lived in Wichita. If he'd done any of this in Los Angeles, it'd been a different story. Even more chilling, BTK threatened he was bearing down on murder victim number eight. He said that, in fact, he was stalking a victim right now. He'd picked his next victim. He indicated how he was going to kill that person. And then the last sentence was, maybe it's you. He was trying to frighten people? Oh, definitely. And he succeeded. It turned out the Wichita police had been intentionally denying BTK publicity for some time. Profilers had warned them against caving in to the killer's demands for attention on the grounds that if he got it, he'd kill again. But that tactic clearly hadn't worked. BTK kept on killing anyway. Now, faced with the Strangler's written threat to take yet another life, the police abruptly changed strategy. At that point, we need to step up and say, yes, we recognize you as BTK, uh, and, uh, and we do have a serial killer here. So Police Chief Richard Lemonyan and News Director Ron Lowen appeared on TV that February 1978 side by side. BTK claims to have strangled a total of seven women. It was Lowen himself who broke the story of BTK to the community. During that newscast, Lowen, who never talked publicly about these events before discussing them with us, became, in effect, live bait. The police said, I guess based again on their talk with their behavioral people, that this is a cry for help. This guy has more that he wants to say. We'd suggest that you do the story so that it has someone that he might choose to communicate with again. How did you feel about offering yourself up as someone who would be willing to communicate with this deranged mass murderer? Well, you know, you, you want to help. So if he wanted to write letters and uh, they came to my attention, why not? It was quite a risk. BTK had already murdered seven people. And Lowen could end up getting far more than just a letter in the mail. But there he sat. What kind of leads do you have? asking questions of Chief Lemonyan, for which there were no good answers. Well, very honestly, we have no solid leads at all. It was horrific news. Everything changed for me, uh, and everything changed for everyone in Wichita. Lowen says the effect of the bombshell announcement on this gentle, family-oriented city was instantaneous. He absolutely terrorized the community. Everyone was a suspect. Girlfriends were concerned about their boyfriends. There were parents who turned in their children. The fear was palpable. Hoping BTK would contact him, the police brought Lowen inside the investigation. Lowen was provided a photo of a possible suspect and a police revolver. That gun creeped me out. It was the tangible reminder that there was a killer out there and that at some level the police thought that he might be coming to see me. Just what was it that drove Dennis Rader to bind, torture, and kill so many innocent people? In his jailhouse interview, Rader blamed his murder spree on that mysterious force he has always claimed was way beyond his control, Factor X. Something that's, I used it, uh, I actually think I'm maybe possessed with demons. Uh, I was dropped on my head when I was a kid. Uh, I've talked to some uh, theological Christian people, and some of those people are really strong. They actually think, well, the Bible says that, that there's demons and 
uh, uh, within you know, or can come into you. Uh, that's the only thing I can figure out. I have, you know, uh, you know, something drove me to do this. You know, the normal people just don't do this. You can't stop it. I can't stop it. It's just, it controls me. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's like it's in the driver's seat. Yeah, that's probably the reason we're sitting here. You know, I could just say no, I don't want to do this and go crawl in a hole, but it's, you know, it's, it's it's driving me. You've actually used the term monster. That there's this monster inside of you. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like that's something separate and apart, like a different person. Yeah, it's it's part of the compartment. It's like I can switch back and forth, and once this character takes over, whatever it is, it drives me over. But criminologist James Allen Fox says he knows what it is. It's bunk. Don't blame me. I'm really a good guy. But Factor X, I just couldn't resist. It's the monster inside of me. Uh, to use a technical term, it's uh, poppycock. It's just an excuse. It was Dennis Rader making the decisions, not Factor X. He speculates at one point that he was dropped on his head. Yeah. And that might have done something. Sure, he'd like to believe that, too. It's someone else's fault. There are lots of kids that fall off tricycles and fall out of cribs and they bang their heads and uh, they don't have Factor X or go on killing sprees. It's just a way to deflect blame. Danis Rader is someone who's selfish, uh, narcissistic, committed to his own pleasures committed to fulfilling his sexual fantasies, no matter who he hurts in the process. In 1978, of course, nobody knew what Raider's excuses were. All they knew was that BTK was out there, a seven-time murderer who was promising in his Factor X manifesto that he was about to take another innocent life. So the investigation went into high gear, unprecedented, and yet unsuccessful for many years, even though he was right under their noses. Desperate police devise an unusual plan, a secret message to BTK. You were hoping that perhaps your killer might yeah. see it. Yeah. Did you get any phone calls? BTK was waiting, 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 waiting. It was 1979, and Ron Lowen was studying yet another package from the mysterious serial killer at large in Wichita. This one, which arrived in Lowen's TV newsroom more than a year after BTK had last been heard from, was announcing not another murder, but a failed attempt. He'd broken the glass. He was in the basement waiting. The intended victim, a 63-year-old woman Raider had been stalking, unexpectedly spent the night out, which saved her life. But Raider made sure everybody knew he was still primed to commit murder, sending the media that package containing some personal items he'd stolen from her home, and including one of his trademark poems. Which was a poem of death. Uh, he said that he was disappointed she didn't come home, that he intended to kill her. Raider now claims in this interview with the psychologist that this woman wasn't the only one that got away. Is it safe to say that there are at least a few lucky people out there? There's a lot of lucky people out there who you didn't kill, that you would dab yeah, Didn't either make it in the house, they come home, or for some reason I didn't go. There's a lot of lucky people out there, yes. There have been more, but probably, if, if I would have succeeded, yeah. I'm, you're almost guaranteed. After that failed murder attempt, Wichita's most famous and sought-after strangler seemed to disappear from the scene. After five years and seven bodies, he stopped communicating in 1979, and the police simply couldn't find him, despite a manhunt unprecedented in scope that went on for years. We spent a lot of their money working on this case, and uh, no one complained, not one bit. We first met former Wichita Police Chief Richard Lemonyan last year, before Dennis Rader was arrested. And he talked quite candidly about the failure to catch BTK on his watch. I think the community was probably as frustrated as I was. And I don't think they were mad. I think they had kind of the same feeling I did. Hey, they're doing everything that they can possibly do to catch this guy. Lemonyan says they'd tried everything, from old-fashioned detective work to some ideas that sounded downright nutty. We were trying to get this guy to communicate. But did you feel at the time like, I don't care how wacky it sounds, let's try it? Anything short of, of psychics, I wasn't into psychics. 
But he was into trying a technique that, as far as we know, has never been attempted by law enforcement before or since. The police once arranged to have a subliminal message, one devised by profilers, inserted into a local evening newscast at Cake TV. To viewers, the subliminal message looked like this, just a flash of light. But slow it down, and there it was. Now, call the chief. And you were hoping that perhaps your killer might yeah. see it. Did you get any phone calls? No, Did anybody's subconscious no. get tapped at all? No, we didn't get anything out of it. Wherever he was, the killer could not or would not be reached. Even when the police got a break and were able to track down a letter BTK sent from a photocopier at Wichita State University, they still couldn't catch him. Turns out Raider was a student there studying criminal justice. We tracked the communication that he sent us to that uh, copy machine that was at the activity center. And we had detectives go back to Xerox company and they confirmed that's where it came from. But he was on a list with several thousand others. If you were a white male between 18 and 35, you were on that list. But we couldn't match him to either on any other list. You will find a homicide at 43 South Pershing. And they had the killer's voice on tape, of course. From that time, he'd boldly called 911 to tell them he'd murdered Nancy Fox. In time, the police were able to have the technical quality of that taped call enhanced, and it was played repeatedly on radio and TV. He said it was probably stupid, but he liked it. He liked the fact that it's been played over and over and over for years and years. Yet even with all that exposure, nobody recognized the voice as that of a man named Dennis Rader. Another dead end. I think I was lucky. I think I was lucky quite a bit. Pretty lucky guy. Pretty lucky guy. Yeah, I think they got close a couple times. I was just lucky. Incredibly so for a killer who may well have been seen several times, a handful of eyewitnesses helped police make sketches of how they remembered the suspect. But the drawings weren't especially helpful because nobody could quite agree on what BTK looked like. As DNA matching evolved during the 1980s, the police tried to use that technology to catch their killer. More than 200 samples were taken from men living near the victims who fit BTK's profile and compared to the semen they'd preserved from several of the crime scenes. Nobody matched. You had DNA evidence. Yes. You had his voice on tape. Yes. And you just couldn't get him. Couldn't get him. You had the best behavioral science minds in the country. Mm-hmm helping you develop a profile of who he was and what he might do. And you couldn't ever anticipate him. Could never anticipate him. Still, Lemonyan says now that while they didn't know anything about Dennis Rader, they knew a lot about BTK. After uh, he went dormant and stopped killing, the theory was, and everyone was saying, well, he's in prison, uh, or maybe he has an illness, or something happened. And I never, I never bought that. I was convinced that he was one of us. We had him pegged in terms of the type of individual we were looking for. We had everything but a name. In the jailhouse interview with the psychologist, which we showed former Chief Lemonyan, Dennis Rader was openly scornful of local law enforcement. And the police or the Keystone cops. And disdainful of all their years of effort. You know, they traced a lot of stuff down. They traced the copier down, the copiers I used uh, out at uh, WSU, but they couldn't make the connection from there. They had 30-some years to break it, and they couldn't do it. The taxpayers are paying the money for such a county. They really need to have, I think, a sharper bunch. Although they tried, they tried, they tried. But Were you offended when you heard him say the Wichita cops couldn't close this case? I'm not offended by anything he says uh, at all. It's all about him. Uh, I know that the police officers did everything in their power. I know that they finally caught him. With everything you know about him now, do you think that you should have been able to get him? I'd like to tell you yes. I really don't think we could have done any more than we did. He called the Wichita police the Keystone Cops. <laughs> I heard that. Uh, again, that's just Dennis Rader because what he was saying is, to allow the Wichita police to catch him, you know, would be demeaning to him. And it, and it just bugs him. It just drives him crazy. So therefore, he has to belittle the police department in order to elevate himself. The conventional wisdom was that somehow he was so smart because he always stayed one step ahead of the police. I don't think he's smart at all. We're not talking about a genius here, you know. We're not talking about a Hannibal Lecter type individual. I think he was just 
more lucky than anything uh, in terms of what he did. Because he did it in such random fashion, and because there was no connection between them, and because he did it alone, uh, and it was so sporadic, and it was over such a long period of time. And probably most important, Lemunyan says, is that Rader apparently told absolutely no one about what he had done. I don't think he even joked about it. I don't think he said, oh, I could be a strangler type thing. I don't think so. Year after year went by, and the once hot BTK investigation eventually became a cold case. By the mid-80s, the elite police unit created to hunt down the killer closed up shop. Once the city's public enemy number one, BTK became part of Wichita legend. And what was Dennis Rader doing all those years? Hiding in plain sight. Those who knew the killer best, were there hints of his secret life? Wouldn't those closest to Dennis Rader, his wife, his children, have had to know something? When Confessions of BTK continues. He spent years stalking and killing innocent people. And then Dennis Rader, known only as BTK, seemed to stop. He gradually disappeared from the headlines he craved. And that is something he now says he could not tolerate. Here again, Edie Magnus. After BTK disappeared in 1979, police would spend 25 more years in a frustrating search to try to capture him. Did you ever look around? Oh, always. BTK, Ron Lowen knew, could be anyone, anywhere. Just listen to what the former Wichita News director told us about the killer a year before BTK was caught. I think this guy is uh, probably a lot more normal than anybody thinks. He told us that it was easy. After he, after he killed someone, he just uh, assumed his rightful place in the world. He's a person who has been walking in that community with him. He's really the stranger beside you. Today, that all sounds positively prophetic, because that's just what Dennis Rader was doing all those years. Hiding in plain sight, raising his children, going to church, getting a degree in his spare time, attending Kansas State University home football games. In fact, Lowen, who took a look at Rader's interview with the psychologist, says the serial killer is even more ordinary than he imagined. His family is so wonderfully Kansas. His daughter was a high school golf champion. His son is, I think, in the Navy. His, his wife sings in the church choir, uh, has a, a job in a, uh, in a convenience store. They're average people uh, making a, a simple good life together. Boy, you, you would never pick him out of a crowd. Uh, I, I thought there would be something that would be more evident. But he was just as beige as beige could be. Mike Fitch knew Rader when they were both employees at ADT, where Rader worked for nearly 15 years installing home security systems. He remembers Rader as a stickler for perfection. Making his customers happy was Rader's top priority, even if he could be cranky and critical of others. I definitely didn't want to get on his wrong side, so I was intimidated by him when I first started working. But Fitch says he saw no hint of Rader's violent side. And we'd sit around and have popcorn before he went home. And what could be more solid American citizen than being active in his young son's Boy Scouts? I shined Dennis up as a Cub Scout leader. Fellow scouting leader Bob Monroe says Dennis Rader always set a good example for the boys in his troop and for Rader's own son, who went on to be an Eagle Scout. You say he took part in everything that we did in scouting and with his son, which is very important in Cub Scouting that you do work with your boys. And so I considered him to be a very good parent and a very good scout leader at that time, of course. Contrary to the common assumption that serial killers are generally loners or social outcasts, criminologist James Fox says they can often seem to be one of us. Many serial killers have families and, and uh, children and friends, and no one suspects them because they have this ordinary, normal-appearing life. And what people don't know about is the darker side. The hidden side. So you can be someone who binds, tortures, and kills one minute and has a seemingly normal life the next? Absolutely. We've seen it time and time again. 
John Wayne Gacy of Chicago, who murdered 33 young men, appeared normal enough. He was once named J.C.'s Man of the Year. Ted Bundy, considered charming, was a law student and socialized in political circles until he was caught. He killed at least 33 women in five different states. On the other hand, New York's David Berkowitz, a.k.a. Son of Sam, who shot six, was a loner. And so, too, was Jeffrey Dahmer of Milwaukee, who dissected dead animals as a child, then later murdered and dismembered 17 young men and boys. But why would anyone ever suspect a man like Dennis Rader? Consider his substantial involvement with his local Lutheran church. Paul Carlstedt has known Rader through the church for 30 years and says he was an exemplary member. He will be an usher. He will uh, run the sound system. He'll count the money after the service. If something needs to be done, uh, Dennis was always available to help. As hard as this may be to believe, the serial killer told the psychologist in this interview that he considers himself a religious person. Do you pray? Yes, I do. Uh, study, study the Bible daily, and it's, that helps uh, not only for uh, not only just for spiritual, but a lot of it's good meanings and good concepts, things that you can use in life. Even serial killers can believe in God. This is not inconsistent with the kind of person who can fulfill his sexual fantasies, who feels he has the right to do it, with people whom he dehumanizes, objects, things. And Dr. Fox sees special significance in Rader taking over as the president of his church congregation just weeks before he was caught. Being in charge, being in control, power, uh, importance is a, is a theme in his life. That's why he pursued this role in the church. In 1991, Rader had found a day job that could give him control and power too. He was made a compliance officer. Rader was now, ironically, in charge of making certain others follow the letter of the law in Park City, just north of Wichita. His duties included making sure homeowners complied with various local ordinances, like keeping their grass cut, their yards free of junked cars, or their dogs from running wild. We've been tracking it down. The dogs are somewhat territorial as well as vicious. That's him being interviewed by a local TV station, the killer himself, right there on the screen for all Wichita to see. Who would ever suspect this public servant was actually the monster, BTK, whom everyone feared? But it was in that job that at least some people saw a darker side to Dennis Rader. Dee Stewart, a longtime acquaintance of Rader's, has a good friend who reported to him in the compliance department. This friend, she says, found him controlling and belligerent. There were times when he, when he yelled at her in front of other employees. Um, he demeaned her. He told her she would never be as smart as he was. But she says he could turn his good and bad sides on and off. He could be berating her. He could be screaming at her. And if the phone rang and it was a member of his family, he turned into Ward Cleaver. Dr. Fox says this apparent Jekyll and Hyde personality is classic for many serial killers. I don't believe there are two raiders in one body. It's just that we all have a range in our personality. And someone like Dennis Rader indeed has two different shades, sides to his personality. And he hides from the people in his life the dark, negative, brutal. Wouldn't those closest to Dennis Rader, his wife, his children, have had to know something? Nope. We'd like to believe that. We, we think it's incomprehensible that those closest wouldn't know. John Wayne Gacy was burying bodies in the crawl space of his home while he lived in that house with his wife. And there was a horrible odor coming from the crawl space. And she'd ask him about it. What's that odor? And he would say it was sewer gases, and he would take care of it. And she believed him. Dennis Rader's wife would never suspect. He gave no signs. They'd find out eventually, because it seems Dennis Rader couldn't stand staying hidden forever. I could just really stir the heart in that stuff by just uh, showing them pictures and puzzles and playing a game with them. I don't even have to go out and kill anybody this time. After years of silence, BTK emerges from the shadows. More clues for police, more heartbreak for victims' families. Mom's house had been broken into and we didn't know what happened to her. That is a trip to hell. When Confessions of BTK continues. 
January 2004 in Wichita, Kansas. Dennis Rader was 58, still living in the house on Independence Street, still a compliance officer for Park City, still an active member of the Christ Lutheran Church. He'd been married 32 years. His son and daughter were all grown up now. And the other Dennis Rader, the brutal strangler who'd so far gotten away with all those murders all that time and hadn't been heard from in 25 years? BTK was retired. He was, he was going to go off the face of the earth. Or so he says, soon enough, an excuse to grab the limelight would come again. The Wichita Eagle published an anniversary article about the mysterious serial killer, known only by the name he'd given himself, BTK, for bind, torture, and kill and who had committed his first murders 30 years earlier. Of course, it was all so long ago, Raider found his exploits weren't even front page news anymore. He says it all made him feel a little itchy. That really stirred it. Uh, I read that in the paper and I thought, I always thought, you know, I'd like to bring this back out again, but should I? Uh, and I think I've reached a point in the life, uh, the kids were gone, you know, not really bored, but kind of bored. And something else, Raider knew a local lawyer was writing a book about him, or about BTK, that is. That didn't sit too well either with the man who had such an enormous appetite to draw attention to himself. Raider felt only he could do justice to his story. Uh, eventually, I was going to tell the story in my terms and not his terms. Uh, they already had the killings, uh, so that's factual. But they didn't know how, how I worked and moved around, the projects, the haunts. Uh, I picked my the victims. They didn't know how that worked. I can just uh, really stir the hornet nest up with, uh, with the media by just uh, showing them pictures and puzzles and playing a game with them. So in March 2004, Raider made contact, not just signaling that he was still around, but far more ominously, sending what appeared to be proof of yet another murder, another young woman whose death had never been conclusively linked to BTK. The innocuous looking piece of mail landed on Wichita Eagle reporter Hearst Laviana's desk. Copied the envelope, copied the letter, took the letter straight to the police department. Did you read it? There's nothing to read. There are no words on it. I thought it was crime scene photographs that some crackpot had gotten hold of on the, on the internet or something. The pictures appeared to be pictures of a dead woman. Her body had been posed several different ways. These were clearly not police photos. And there was something else, a photocopy of a driver's license. Vicki Weggerly's driver's license, and I immediately knew this probably came from Vicki Weggerly's killer. In September 1986, Vicki Weggerly, a young mother, was found tied up and strangled in her home, and a trophy had been taken, in this case, her driver's license. So police had naturally suspected BTK, but there were differences too, especially that the killer had never publicly boasted about it afterward, as was his pattern. Now, all these years later, in addition to the copies of the photos and the driver's license, there was the envelope they came in. The return address said Bill Thomas Kilman, BTK. And that's when we realized this may be the real deal. Tell me about that moment. It was just total disbelief that he was still here. Laviana agreed to give the police two days to nail it down and then broke the story. The ghost was back. Police could now say that more than 17 years earlier, Vicki Weggerly had indeed been BTK's eighth known victim. So by resurfacing in, in 2004 and sending a, a letter with a photograph and uh, driver's license of the victim, say, I'm still here. You never caught me, and I've been here all along. His need for attention uh, is apparently unquenched. I absolutely thought that, that this was the tip of the iceberg. Former Wichita TV News director Ron Lowen made that prediction to us almost a year before Dennis Rader was caught. And sadly, when it was all over, he'd be proven right. There had been two more murders never before connected to BTK that brought the total number of his victims to 10. In 2004, Rader was still hiding evidence about his murder of Maureen Hedge. She lived on his block and they knew each other. In court, Raider described how, after bowling one evening in 1985, he broke into her house and waited for her to come home. And she screamed and I jumped on the bed and strangled her manually. Rather than leaving her body, Raider changed his M.O., confusing police at the time. Killed her in her house, 
put her in the trunk of her car, took her to his church, put her on a blanket, tied her up in different bonding situations, took pictures of her, then put her back uh, in the trunk and took her out and dumped her. It was the middle of the night. He had a key because he was uh, one of the uh, leaders of the church. Marine Hedge's body was later found buried under some leaves and branches in this ditch, several miles from her home. And even as his persona, BTK, re-emerged in 2004, Raider was also hiding evidence about his last victim, Dolores Davis, whom he killed in 1991. He'd seen her out in the yard working and uh, had sexual feelings. Her son, Jeff, talked to us recently after viewing Raider's interview with the psychologist. She was a very kind, considerate, empathetic, gentle person. Given the circumstances of her death, I think she kept her class and her dignity and her poise right up to the end. All right, so you used a concrete block to break the window. In court, Raider said he used a concrete block as a battering ram to crash through Dolores Davis' sliding glass door and enter her home. Uh, removed her handcuffs and, uh, and then tied her up and then, and then eventually strangled her. Raider then took her body from the house. Authorities knew only that she was missing. Probably kidnapped a bastard dead at worst. So that kind of started the clock on a 13 day, seemingly 13th century time frame where we didn't know what happened to her. And that, that, is, that is a trip to hell. 13 days later, his mother's body was found under a bridge. But of course, police didn't know then who'd done it. Jeff Davis says he slipped into despair and depression that destroyed his marriage and worse. I would go to bed every night for the better part of five years, and I prayed to God that he let me die. Dolores Davis's driver's license and social security card had gone missing. That was certainly the kind of thing BTK did to his murder victims. But there were many other aspects of this crime that strayed from his usual M.O. So until Raider was caught and the police announced Dolores Davis as the 10th victim, her son was left to wonder. I guess there was the remote possibility that there was some phantom serial out there, but honestly, I never connected it with BTK. How Dennis Rader led police straight to his door. He said, we've got him. Confessions of BTK continues in a moment. Would he kill again? That was the question consuming much of Wichita, Kansas, in the weeks after serial killer BTK announced himself in 2004, following years of silence. I definitely locked my doors at night until I find out more. Here in the heartland, fear of the unknown monster among them penetrated yet a new generation. My mom's going to watch out for my little sister more. People were learning karate, buying guns, beefing up security systems, and looking at strangers with a suspicion not felt in years. In his jailhouse interview, Raider now claims he didn't know he was having this effect. But I didn't realize the city really lived in fear of that bad. Uh, all I saw was spurts of it on the news. But women come home and look under their doors and, uh, and under their beds and just really lived in fear. I didn't realize that I uh, had that potential. I dropped, dropped my jaw and I had a pad of paper and I made a note and I just scroll liar. Once again, even with the learned psychologist there, he's playing a game. At the very least, says criminologist James Fox, Raider is being completely disingenuous. He says for the serial killer, the fear is all part of the twisted fun. Part of the enjoyment that serial killers have is not just manipulating the victims and tying them up, but manipulating a community and tying them up in a grip of terror. What's now known is that Raider hadn't taken a life since 1991. His explanation to the psychologist about why he stopped at 10 victims is once again chillingly matter of fact. Why aren't there more viruses or more? It, it seemed like as I got older, uh, I started making, well, physically, I was, just wasn't up to it. Uh, I knew like, if we had a fight with somebody, you'd have to be an older person because just I'd be just winded or wouldn't be able to fight physically. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think I was just starting to mellow out a little bit. 
Fox believes it's probably not just coincidence that Rader stopped committing murder around the time he got that job as a compliance officer. Now he really had some power. Now he could really push people around. So he didn't have to do it with physical violence. He could do it through his job. The killer still lusted for notoriety, however. So after first revealing himself in that letter to the Wichita Eagle, he sent a slew of letters and packages throughout 2004 and into early 2005 to local TV stations, the police, even leaving clues in a public park. A doll with dark hair, her face colored with makeup, her arms bound behind her by a pair of pantyhose. Her head contained in a plastic bag, and next to the doll was a copy of the driver's license of one of BTK's victims, Nancy Fox. A handmade word puzzle, which investigators now see contains a group of letters spelling D. Raider and the numbers of his address. It all put Wichita's serial strangler front and center again, just how he liked it. Was that exciting to you? Was that sexually exciting to you? Probably the media, not maybe sexually, but the media attention. You know, mm -hmm. I listen to the news quite a bit, and yeah, I get, I get pretty excited to read the paper. Did you ever think you were going to get caught? No, 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 no. This guy was not going to get caught. You didn't Absolutely get caught. not. No, I didn't want to get caught. Okay. I wanted to put everything on floppies. They would go to a floppy to a CD. The CD would either go to a safe deposit or a very hiding hole, and I could always bring it back out. Many have speculated that Raider's repeated messages were indeed a cry to be captured. But James Fox says it's just the opposite. He felt invincible, unstoppable. And that's why many serial killers do communicate with the police. Not because they want to invite capture. It's because they feel that the police are no match for their skill, their cunning, their stardom, their brilliance. So. What often happens in, among serial killers is they get so cocky and they make a mistake. And that's just what happened. It was Raider himself who helped bring police to his door. It started in January 2005 when Raider placed a letter in a pickup truck at this Home Depot, which eventually made its way to police. In it, Raider, identifying himself only as BTK, asked the police whether they could catch him if he used a computer disk to communicate. He asked the police to respond in a classified ad, and he asked them to be honest. I mean, he actually asked the police yeah, if they could catch you. They said no. They said no. Did you really think they were going to tell you the truth? No, I thought they would. I, I thought they wanted me to finish the story. I really thought I had a rapport with them, you know, and I really did. I mean, doesn't that seem kind of dumb? <laughs> yeah, it does. To believe that the police would tell you the truth about something like that? I mean, he's been playing games with us for 30 years, and you think we're not we're, we're going to shoot straight with you? I don't think so. So naturally, the police lied and told the killer they couldn't trace a disc to him and waited to see if he would fall for it, which he did. Raider's last communication was a computer disc filled with more taunts and puzzles. He sent it to a local television station. The police were able to trace it to a Dennis and a computer at Raider's church. By Googling the church name and Dennis, police quickly zeroed in on Dennis Raider. What nailed him ultimately was the last floppy disk, he said. Yeah, well, what nailed him was his hubris. Uh, he went too far. Police also used a surveillance tape from that Home Depot to figure out that the person who dropped off the BTK letter was driving a car registered to Dennis Rader's son. But to make certain they had their man, they needed a DNA match. So authorities got a warrant for a tissue sample from Rader's daughter on file at a Kansas medical clinic. Tests showed it was a close match to the evidence drawn from the crime scenes. It was now early in the week of February 21st, 2005, and former police chief Richard Lemunyan remembers quite well when he got the news he'd waited more than 30 years to hear. Simply said, we've got him. He said, it's just a matter of time. We've got him. Locked up and choked up. Uh, that first Sunday was probably my lowest day of all my life. Tears from a killer, but not for his victims. When Confessions of BTK continues. Dennis Rader spent the morning of February 25th, 2005 on the job in Park City, where as the town's compliance officer, Rader was responsible for things like corralling mad dogs or 
chewing people out of their grass grew too high. Normal work day, uh, didn't have any suspicions. Although I've been, been really careful about watching people and actions and stuff, uh, I usually pretty good about that. He says he noticed nothing unusual, except maybe a moment when he overheard on his police radio the FBI was up to something in his town. And I thought, well, you know, maybe something's coming down. Shall I run? But where would I run if they were after me? I just took a calculated guess that that was something else and hoped for. Then at midday, the killer went home for lunch. Drove home, and just as soon as I got uh, started turned down, there's a frontage road. I saw this whole line of police cars. I thought, oh, that's not good. And it's just, uh, they were right on me just that quick. I thought maybe maybe it's a traffic stop or something. But as soon as I one of them was behind me with the red lights and sirens, I knew that was it. With that, Dennis Lynn Rader, the man believed to be BTK, was finally in custody after 31 years. They arrested me, yep. They uh, got out of the car, they pulled the guns on me, told me to lay down, and I sprawled out, and they grabbed me real quick like from handcuffs and stuck me in a car. Well, Mr. Rader, do you know why you're going downtown? And I said, oh, I have sus suspicions why. At first, uh, I was hoping that uh, it was kind of a kind of a cat and mouse game uh, that they had a suspect, but but it but it, but it kind of hurt, you know. I, you know, like I said, I had the power. You know, I was a law enforcement officer technically, and here I am. Uh, these law enforcement officers are trying to do their do my duty. So it kind of hurt a little bit. But before long, Raider, in his self-obsessed arrogance, was talking up a storm and says in this interview with the psychologist, he actually was having a good time connecting to the police officers. Also, during the interrogation, it seems as though you were enjoying being one of them at times. It's almost like you know, colleagues talking com shop. Camaraderie, camaraderie, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talk shop. Uh, I know a lot of police terminology. I know how they do things. So it, yeah, it's kind of a bonding type thing. Did you, you, know, you, really talk you enjoy it on any level? Uh, yes, I did. You know, uh, all I knew was sunk or soon would be, but yeah, I enjoyed it. And one, once, uh, once the confession was out and I admitted who I was, then, then the bonding really started. Mm -hmm. You know, I just really opened up, and you know, we shared jokes and everything else. It was just like we were buddies. He's proud of what he'd done. Uh, he was having, in a perverse way, fun talking with his uh, his colleagues, the police. What do you make of the camaraderie he says he enjoyed with all of the police officers who were interrogating him when he was arrested? Well, it, it implies a certain degree of, um, of, of control here on the situation. I'm a good guy, they're a good guy, we're all in the same profession here. I work law enforcement, uh, technically, and he was a wannabe cop. It makes him feel better to, to think of them as peers. But however much Raider may have imagined he was still in control, the reality was just the opposite. Richard Lemonyan, who once headed up the department Raider dismisses as the Keystone Cops, says the script was going their way now. Were they, in fact, playing him? Absolutely. These, these officers that were interviewing him were handpicked. They had studied him. They knew the characteristics. They were playing to his ego, to his strength. They were bringing him up, making him think that, you know, hey, we're buddy buddies. Then, just as quickly, they shut him down. The interview ended, the attention stopped, and the officers went home. It was only then, Rader tells the psychologist, that the reality of his past and the impact on his future finally started to sink in. Was there any way of uh, getting out of this? You know, is there any possible way? And I thought, no, there isn't any way. This, they've just got too much on me. And then most of my thoughts went back to my family. You know, how my family was holding up. How are they taking this? I think this main thing is just, you know, you're, you're caught, carcinated, and all those things that you enjoyed, you know, they're, they're gone. You know, you just, you just, you know, you have to be in a position to realize it. And I don't think normal people are outside in the world can visualize that. It, you know, just like right now, you know, you just, you know, touch people and hold them and, you know, your kids and stuff. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just gone. This was one of the few moments during the interview where Raider revealed any emotion when he was talking about himself and his family. Well, anyway, uh, you know, people don't realize that, uh, you know, once you're gone, you can't go out and 
uh, out in fresh air, walk your dog, hug your wife, kiss your wife. I mean, go to a movie, have a pizza, hamburger, it's all gone. It's all about him. When you watch him, do you feel anything? You feel pain. Because every time I see him, I see all of those victims and the tortured looks on their faces from all the crime scenes and what he actually did. He left that part out. He never mentioned him. Instead, all Raider could do was complain to the psychologist about how he missed all the attention he'd been receiving from his police interrogators. He did not come Saturday. It was probably that, uh, that first Sunday was probably my lowest day of all my life. I was really depressed. He called it the lowest day of his life. Can you imagine? This is a man who has already been arrested. He's ripped from his family probably forever. They despise him. Oh, by the way, he's killed 10 people. And the lowest day of his life is when the interrogation doesn't continue. Doesn't this tell us a lot about, about Dennis Rader? And next, the killer gets his day in court. Will heartbroken families get peace? People use the word closure, there is no such thing. When Confessions of BTK continues. The bottom line, BTK is arrested. While Dennis Rader sat in his cell with no one to satisfy his desire to keep talking about himself, the police and a cast of dozens proudly announced his capture to the citizens of Wichita and the world. Agents from the KBI, Agents from the FBI and members of the Wichita Police Department arrested Dennis Rader, 59, a white male. But it wasn't until late June, when Rader appeared in court for what was supposed to be the first day of his trial, that people got a good look at and earful from the man who had killed so many people over so many years. Instead of maintaining the not guilty plea he'd entered earlier, there was a surprise. Would you please stand with counsel? Sir, I have been advised it is your desire to enter a plea of guilty in this case. Is that correct? Yes, sir. People in and out of court listened aghast to Raider as he detailed each murder in his cold, chilling, emotionless manner. No, I manually strangled her when she started to scream. Ron Lowen watched Raider's court appearance on TV. People make a lot of the point that he didn't show any emotion. He was showing incredible emotion. Uh, the, the detail that he used, he paused and he'd search for words. Uh, the graphic, graphic description that he gave. This wasn't someone who was stumbling, who was uh, nervous. This was showtime for him. Uh, he couldn't have asked for a better stage. The killer was clearly puffed up by his court appearance, bragging about it afterward when he spoke with the psychologist. It's only been a few hours since that hearing. How are you feeling? I really feel pretty good. It's kind of like a big burden that was lifted off my shoulders. Um, uh, and on the other hand, I feel like I'm kind of like a star right now. As you might expect, a certain former police chief would love to lower the curtain on Dennis Rader right now. I'd like to be the one to be able to put him in a cell and turn his lights out. That's what I'd like to do. So how does someone like Dennis Rader get to be this way? Well, that's a $64,000 question that we don't completely know. Part of it is the propensities that you're born with. And part of it, too, is, is what kind of environment you're growing into. These are all the, the intangibles that we can't predict and don't fully understand. Raider told the psychologist he'll make amends in his way to his God. I know it's personal, but could you tell me what you pray for? Actually, uh, like for the other day, I prayed for that the family would uh, accept me on uh, their the court. You know, that they would, you know, you know, accept that as forgiveness. Your family, whose family? My family, my family. family. Yeah. And also, I mentioned there the, the, the victim families that they would, you know, not that they can forgive me, but maybe someday they can realize that, you know, I got some problems. And... Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's the classic understatement in the world. We asked Jeff Davis, the son of Raider's last victim, what he thought about that. He does have problems, all of which are of his own making. He did not come from any abused family. He can't blame any environmental factors. He can't blame anybody or any sickness or being dropped on his head. Wish they dropped him a little harder. He can't blame anything. Davis, who like so many other family members, is also a victim of BTK, wrote a book to help him and others cope with the trauma of loss. 
and to make sure people knew how special his mother Dolores was. I would be damned if her legacy ended with her being murdered. A beautiful, loving, kind, gentle person and her legacy is being murdered and dumped out in the ditch like a bag of dirty laundry for the dogs to go through and I was not going to let that happen. Just after Davis's book was published in 1996, he received a letter from a taxpayer who Davis now firmly believes was Dennis Rader. It has never before been made public. The letter said, we'll call the serial killer the Phantom of Northern Sedgwick County, which is where Rader lived. It also said, I'm sure that he probably blends in with a crowd. I'm Jeffrey Davis, son of Dolores Davis. At Raider's sentencing, Davis was able to speak directly to the killer. For the last 5,326 days, I have wondered what it would be like to confront the walking cesspool that took my mother's precious life. Even if you could begin to fathom the depth of my hatred for you, I would still refuse to waste any breath on you because that would once again allow you the satisfaction of being in the limelight and that attention I refuse to allow you. As of today, you no longer exist. Charlie Otero and his sister Carmen spoke too. Raider, you not only affected my life, but you took away the joy of the ultimate grandparents, aunt and uncle relationship my children deserve. Just recently, I realized that I could not remember my mother's voice. It was a painful discovery. But as I put my thoughts on paper, it comes to me. I am my mother's voice, and I know we've been heard. Family members of other victims gave their thoughts. On the day he dies, Nancy and all of his victims will be waiting with God and watching him as he burns in hell. When it was time for Raider to speak to the court, he characteristically showed little emotion. Now that I've confessed, put myself out to let everybody know what's going on, I expect to heal and to have life. And then hopefully someday God will accept me. And finally, I finally apologize to the victim's families. There's no way that I can ever repay them. The murders were committed before Kansas reinstated the death penalty. When it came time to sentence Raider, the judge showed no mercy, giving him the maximum sentence. To serve a term of life for which you will not be parole eligible until the expiration of 40 years. Jeff Davis says even though he was finally able to confront the killer of his mother, he is left feeling empty. People use the word closure, there is no such thing. Closure happens when you go back to that moment in time and it doesn't happen and the person's still there. Charlie Otero, who also faced a hard life after the murder of his parents, sister and brother, knows what Davis means. I would wonder about what they were thinking and the feelings that they had while this was happening to them. You know, this has been the most intense and challenging My family's murders with me daily. It never leaves me. Police the department. memories of my family come back to me whenever I see a f husband hug his wife or a father and a son play. I think of my family and what I had lost. For so long, Charlie Otero, Jeff Davis, and so many others have wanted to know why, why their loved ones were victims. And now they know it was one man's inability to control his sexual fantasies, one man's depraved indifference to human life, and terrible coincidence for 10 innocent people who were caught in Dennis Rader's murderous web. I keep seeing these victims. I keep seeing these people that he tortured and murdered and killed, and, and I just look at him in wonderment, thinking, how can someone just stand there and talk like we just had lunch and had a sandwich or something and just go on with it. It's just evil, evil personified. That's all for now. I'm Stone Phillips for Ann Curry and all of us at NBC News. Thanks for watching.